We went around the same turn. I could not have told you how they differed. Eight or ten more times. After about another hour, which would have made it, from the heat and the height of the sun, about noon or early afternoon, we came around another turn like the others, but across the river was a plank bridge set in a steel frame. Just beyond it was a gentle spillway. A man and a boy were fishing with cane poles below it. We muscled the canoe laboriously cross river to land. When we touched the bank, Bobby got to his feet in the canoe and swayed for a minute, then stepped out into the kudzu. I got into the slime and waded out of the river and never touched it again with my feet or legs. We beached the canoe and took off our life preservers. Lewis lay there beyond us with his hands crossed over him. He was terrifically sunburned. Flakes of skin came off his lips when he moved them. Lewis, I said from land, do you hear me? I hear you, he said calmly and strongly, but with his eyes closed. I hear you and I've been hearing you. You've got it figured. We can get out of this. They won't ask me anything, and if they do, I've got the word, same as you gave Bobby. You're doing it exactly right. You're doing it better than I could. Hang in there. Do you feel anything in your leg? No, but I haven't moved it or fooled with it or thought about it for a long time. I keep trying to put it to sleep back yonder, and now I can't wake it up. It doesn't matter, though. I'm all right. I'm going to get somebody. I said, can you hold out a little longer? Sure, he said. My God, those falls must have been something back there. They were something. We could have done it a lot better if we'd had you, buddy. You had me, he said. You should have seen the water between those rocks. I don't know, he said, getting faint again. I had it another way. I felt it in my leg, and I tell you, I know something I didn't know before. There was a good smile on his face. He tried to get his head up from the dried vomit, then sank back in it. Are you sure about Drew? he asked. They can't find him? They won't find him, I said. Not if I have anything to say about it. That's it then, I guess, he said. Go and get somebody, anybody. I want to get out of this goddamn roasting oven. I want to get out of my coffin, this fucking piece of tin junk. Lie still. We're home free. Lie still and don't worry. I told Bobby to stay with the canoe and climbed up the kudzu of the bank to the road that ran across the bridge. It was a thin blacktop state highway, and about a half a mile along, it was a country gas station, a store with two stark yellow pumps, probably shell. I stood, wondering how I could get there without killing myself, and also waiting for the road to unfreeze and begin to flow around me. The stillness underfoot was disturbing, but it stayed, and from it I looked back down at the river. It was beautiful and I was sure I would feel all my life like the particular pull of it at different places, the weight and depth and speed of it. They had been given to me. I was heavy in the air now, and floundered a little, walking. My side was caked shut, and the part of the flying suit I had tied around me had clotted into the wound. I could not have gotten it out without fainting, so I let it stay, holding it in with an elbow and leaning over it a little, away from the road. I went toward the station, crossing the bridge over the spillway. The station moved off in the sun and shimmered like an oil slick, and I went after it as best I could. My side hurt badly, but it seemed to have moved from me a little bit. The rag seemed to go around it instead of through it, so that it was like carrying a painful package or ball under my arm. I had a quick dry period between the time when the river water dried off my legs and the close nylon began to flap with sweat. By the time I got to the station, I was striped with my own darkness. 
A country teenager was sitting on the backless bottom of a kitchen chair just inside the screen door, which was shifting and tapping with flies. Though he had probably been watching me come, he could not believe me at close range. He got up and opened the door. Is there a phone here? I asked. He looked as though he didn't know whether there was or not. I've got to get an ambulance out here, I said, and I've got to get the highway patrol. People are hurting and one's dead. I let him make the calls because I didn't know where on earth the station was. Just don't, just tell them there's an accident. There's been an accident on the river and tell them where to come, but tell them to come quick. I don't think I can last and there's another man hurt worse than I am. He hung up finally and said there'd be somebody along directly. I sat down and tilted back in a chair and was perfectly still, getting my story together one more time, the most important time. But back of the story was the reason for the story, and the woods, and the river, and all that had happened. There must be some way for me to get used to the idea that I had buried three men in two days, and that I had killed one of them. I had never seen a dead man in my life except a brief glance at my father in his coffin. It was strange to be a murderer, especially sitting where I was sitting, but I was too tired to be worried and didn't worry except about Bobby's ability to remember what I had told him. A car or two went by and I waited to hear one slow down. My side hurt, but the pain was in repose, and lay there under my arm, a part of me that I had made and could live with. I wondered if I should tell whatever doctor dressed it that I had gored myself on my own arrow, or that I had cut myself on the canoe when we turned over, since there were several places on it where the banging around it had taken on the rocks had forced the metal apart and made flanges and projections that might conceivably cut. I decided to go with the arrow, for there might still be some paint in the wound, and some parts of the wound were clean cut by the razor head, and the jagged aluminum wouldn't have done that. I began to take on so much weight that I could not get up, and then I could not even get my head up. I could feel my still body still trying to make paddling movements, I thought I was stiff, but I must not have been, for when someone touched my bare arm at the shoulder where I had cut off the sleeve, the muscles jumped tight again. It was a Negro ambulance driver. Have you got a doctor with you? We got one, he said. We got a good one. He young and good. What in this world happened to you, man? What in this world? Somebody shoot you? The river, I said. The river happened to me. But I'm not the one. I'm just the only one who can move. We've got a man back down across the bridge who's bad hurt, and the other fellow had to stay with him. Also, one was killed, or I guess he was. We couldn't find him. You want to come show us where your man is at? I'll come if I can get up. If I sit in this chair much longer, I'm going to fall out of it. He went to my good side, and I rose like a mountain into the air of fan belts where a few cheap cockeyed pairs of dark glasses formed on a piece of yellow cardboard. Hold on to me, man, he said. He was slight and steady, and I put my good arm around his shoulders, but my knees were going, the world was going. You can't make it, he said. You sit right back down. I can make it, I said as the glasses focused again. I told the boy at the store to tell the police where we were going, and the driver and I walked out into the sun, where the little white country ambulance sat. The doctor was in the front seat, writing something. He looked up and got out all in the same motion. He opened the back doors. Bring him around here and let him lie down. I crawled onto the stretcher and turned on my back. It was hard to do. I didn't want to turn loose the driver. He not only felt good to me, but he felt like a good person, and I needed one bad. Just that contact was what I needed most. I didn't need myself anymore. I I had had too much of that for too long. The young doctor, sandy-haired and pale, 
crouched beside me. No, no, I said. It's not me. I can wait. Go back across the bridge. There's a man in a canoe who's got a bad fracture. It may have hemorrhaged in some way. Let's get him looked after first. We drove down the highway. A land motion of machines and peculiar to the bridge, and I got out one more time. I probably didn't have to, but I thought it would be best. Lewis was still in the canoe, stretched out and sweating, his shirt half dark and his arm over his eyes, and Bobby was talking to the man and boy who'd been fishing. I knew Bobby must have been testing his story out on them, and I hoped he made good use of the time to get it straight. The others looked as though they believed him. It is hard to disbelieve injured, exhausted men, and that was a great advantage. The driver and the doctor helped Lewis out of the canoe and onto the stretcher. The county hospital was in Aintree, about seven miles off. We got ready to go, but we were standing around the ambulance. While we were standing around the ambulance, the highway patrol drove up, the siren droning faintly. A short fellow stepped out and then a rough-looking blonde boy. I got ready. What's going on? The blonde officer said. We've had a bad accident, I said, swaying a little more than I was actually swaying. I cut that out. Acting might ruin the whole thing. One of our party drowned in the river about ten miles upstream. He looked at me. Drowned? Yes, I said. I believed I had got past the first of it, like the first of a bad set of rapids, but there was no way out except to keep on. How do you know he drowned it? Well, we capsized in the rapids, and it was just every man for himself. I didn't know what happened to him. He may have hit his head on a rock, but I don't know. We just couldn't find him, and I don't see how he could not be drowned. I hope he's not, but I'm afraid he is. He has to be. While I was talking, I looked him in the eyes, which was surprisingly easy to do. They were sharp, but sympathetic. As I went through some of the story that Bobby and I had rehearsed on the river, I made it a point to try to visualize the things I was saying as though they had really happened. I could see us searching for Drew, though we never had. I saw these things happen at the place near the yellow tree, and for me they were happening as I talked. It was hard to realize that they had not taken place in the actual world. As I saw him taking them into account, they became part of a world, the believed world, the world of recorded events, of history. Well, he said, we'll have to drag the river. Can you show us about where it was? I think so, I said, not wanting to appear too sure, but fairly sure. I don't know if there's a road in there, but I believe I'd know the place if I could get to it. We've got a hurt man, though. We've got to get him to a hospital. Okay, he said, a little reluctant to have the situation pass from his jurisdiction to the doctors. We'll check in on you at the hospital later. Fine, I said, and crawled back into the ambulance beside Lewis. We rode, and this kind of riding, though it wasn't what I had got used to, was never better. The tires crunched at last, and we stopped. I sat up a little at a time. We were off in a field, and alongside us was a long, flat building that looked like a rural high school. A warm wind was blowing over it. The doctor opened my vision wide, a door in each hand. This is it, buddy, he said. Take it easy. We'll get your friend out. Just go along with Cornelius. I took hold of the driver again, and we went through some glass doors, up a ramp, into a long hall that appeared to run out of sight, ending in a window the size of microfilm, way off and across. Second door to the right, the driver said, and we went there. I sagged down on a white, tight table, the sheets straining under me. In a minute or two, they brought Lewis, but didn't bring him into the room. They brought him on a table outside the door and then noiselessly rolled him on toward the faraway window. I lay and held my old friend, my side. The doctor came back onto, 
soft feet. Let's see now, buddy, he said. Can you raise it up just a little bit? Does the zipper still work? I think so, I mumbled. I tried to sit up and made it easily and even zipped the zipper down with my good hand. He took off my tennis shoes and I slithered out of the remains of the flying suit. My shorts were stuck in the wound like the nylon I had bound up in it, but he put something painless out of a bottle in the whole mass of cloth and flesh, and the shorts began to come away. He threw what I had been wearing into a corner and started working on my side. Things were dissolving there. Piece after piece of cloth, or of me, softened, softened, and came away, and he kept throwing them down below me in the bare room. My side was breathing like a mouth, and it did not feel at all bad any more, only stranger and more open. "'Good Lord, fellow,' he said. "'What's been chopping on you? "'Looks like somebody hit you in the side with an axe.' "'Does?' "'Then more professionally, "'how'd you do this?' "'We were trying to do a little illegal bow hunting "'up down the banks of the river,' I said. "'It's not such a good thing to do, but we were doing it. "'We were going to miss the regular season, "'and we wanted to try it this way. "'How in the hell did you manage to shoot yourself with an arrow? "'I didn't think it could be done.' He was working and looking into my blood all the time, very busy and talking calmly. I talked calmly. I had the bow and arrows in the canoe with me when we dumped. I tried to hold on to the bow because I didn't want to be in the woods without any weapon at all, and it sliced up my hands. I held up the arrows, excuse me, I held up the hand the arrows had sliced up, just as I said, and the next thing I knew... I had tangled with a rock, and something was going through my side, and the bow was gone. I don't have any idea where it went. Down river, that's all I know. Well, it made a good clean cut, he said. That got ragged. Part of it is real clean, and part of it is hacked up and looks solid. You've got some kinds of foreign matter in there, and I'm going to have to get out. There was some camouflage paint on the arrows, I said. That's what it was. But there might be something else in there, too. God knows what's in there. We'll get it out, he said. Then we'll sew you up like a quilt. You want a shot? Yeah, I said. Scotch. You can have another kind before you get the scotch, he said. You might have to wait a while for the scotch. This is a dry county. You mean you don't have any moonshine in this here hospital? And you're way off in the country like this? What the hell is North Georgia coming to? No white lightning, he said. We advise against it. Contains lead salts, most of it. He gave me a shot in the hip and started working again. I looked out the window at the closing green of the day. There was nothing to see but the changes of green. You want to stay here with us tonight? There's plenty of room. We got a whole hospital. And you'll never get another chance like this one, I can tell you. It's peaceful here. No shotgun farmers, nobody who tangled up with a tractor, nobody on glucose from a drunk smash-up, nobody but you and your buddy, a little boy, snake bite case, and he'll be gone tomorrow. Copperhead poison is not such hot poison. No thanks, I said, though I would have stayed with Lewis if I thought there was any use to it. Get me sewed up and tell me where there's a rooming house I can stay in. I'd like to call my wife and... I'd like to be by myself. I wouldn't like sleeping in a ward if I can help it, or in a hospital room if I absolutely don't have to. You've lost some blood, he said. You'll be pretty weak. I've been weak for days, I said. Give me whatever you need to give me and I'll get going. I sent your friend the other fellow at the canoe to Biddeford's down in town. They'll treat you okay, but if I were you, I'd stay out here tonight. No, thanks, I said. I'll be all right. Tell the police where I am. Just drive me over there and take care of Lewis. The other doctor is working on him. It looks like a complicated situation with him. He'll be lucky if there's not some gang green building up around that place. That's a hell of a break. We're lucky we've got you, I said. You're fucking A, he said. Hands of an angel.
He drove me in his own car down through town, and in the main filling station were sitting Lewis's station wagon and Drew's olds. <clears throat> I went in, up tight in my side, but not having to hold it together any more, and talked to the owner and got the addresses of the Griner brothers so that we could send them the rest of the money. Lewis had arranged it all, and I had to have the owner of the station give back to me what I was supposed to do. I didn't have enough money, but I could either get it from Lewis or mail it in when I got back to the city. The main thing was that the keys were there. I said goodbye to the doctor, told him I'd come to the hospital the next day. Then I called Martha and told her something bad had happened, that Drew had drowned and Lewis had broken a leg. I asked her to call Lewis's wife and say he was in the hospital up here and would be for some time, but that he was going to be okay. If Mrs. Bollinger called on Lewis's wife, they were just going to say that we'd be back in a couple of days. I wanted to tell Mrs. Bollinger about Drew's death myself. I said I thought I'd be home about the middle of the week. I drove Drew's car to Biddeford's, a big frame house booming and knocking with people and light. Everybody was at supper around a long swayed-back pine table with strips of flypaper hanging down to within a foot of it. Bobby was there with his face working around a mouthful of food, and I winked at him and sat down. They made a place for us, farmers, wood sawyers, and small merchants, and I lost interest in everything but eating. Fried chicken came around me, came at me from every angle, again and again, and potato salad and heavy coarse biscuits and gravy and butter and collards and lima beans and big hominy and turnip greens and cherry pie. It was good. It was all good. <clears throat> Afterwards, a woman showed me upstairs to a room with a big double bed, which was all they had left. Bobby was somewhere else. But for some reason, I was too dry. My mouth was dry in my skin. So I went down and took a shower in the basement in the blue-green country night where I stood with the river water pouring over my head, making my tight new bandage grow like a heavy side pack, making it bleed a little with the warm water. I nearly went to sleep there, but woke up as the water gradually turned cold. Then I went upstairs, my hair inside wet, and got in bed. It was over. I lay awake all night in brilliant sleep. After. When I woke up, I was holding on to my side again, a tight, glowing package. I came awake fairly fast because the mid-morning sun, or so it looked and felt, was beginning to sting my eyelids. I was in a big country room with loud reddish curtains and a huge mirror on the wall opposite me, a little bathroom behind me, a dresser with all the knobs missing on one side, and a hooked rug on the floor, under the bed and all around. I lay and thought. I wanted to see Bobby first, and then Lewis. I got up, naked except for the bandage, which felt very much like clothes of some sort, and picked up what was left of my flying suit from the floor, clotless, armless, and ragged. I sure didn't want to put it back on, but I did, and felt for some money. I had a couple of bills that appeared to have been made and issued by the river, but they were still money, and we needed it. I left the knife and belt in the room and started to go after Bobby. There in the mirror, I was the survivor of some kind of explosion, with a shirt sleeve ripped off and a pants leg blown open, bearded and red-eyed, not able to speak. Out of this, I smiled very whitely, splitting the beard. When I found out from the lady clearing away breakfast where Bobby was, I went up to his room and knocked on the door. He was still asleep, but it would be better to settle the new things I had been thinking about with him now than later. I kept knocking, and after a time he came. 
I sat down in a rocking chair, and he sat on the bed. First of all, I said, I need some clothes. You probably ought to have some, too, if we've got enough money. Your clothes are in better shape than mine, so you go out and get me some pants, blue jeans are all right, and a shirt. Get whatever else you'll need, and if you've got anything left, buy me some shoes, uh, Brogan's. Okay. There ought to be a hardware store right around here, and in this town, everything is right around here. Now listen one more time. We're all right so far. We're golden. Lewis is getting taken care of, and our stories, uh, maybe I should say our story, is going over. I didn't see a flicker of doubt in anybody's eye. Did you? I don't think so, but I'm not as sure as you are. Did that one guy ask you about the canoes? No, what guy? What about the canoes? The little old guy who's some sort of local lawman. He asked me about the other canoe. Where was it? Where did we lose it? When did we lose it? What was in it? What did you tell him? I told him what we agreed to tell him, that we lost it in that last bad place. Did he say anything else? No, I don't have any idea what he was getting at. I do, I said. At least I think I do, and it could be trouble. Maybe not real trouble, but trouble. Why, for the Lord's sake? Because we lost the green canoe the day before yesterday, and it, or part of it, might even have been found before we got to the place where we said we lost it. Jesus. We'll have to try to patch it up then. It's likely that this little guy is going to get the word around to the state police that something doesn't jibe in our story, and then they'll be asking us all sorts of questions. Remember your movies. Police like to separate suspects and try to get them to contradict each other. So we've just got to sit here right now and become contradict proof. Can we do it? We have to try. I think we can. Let's go back. We lost the other canoe when Drew was really killed, right? Right. There's nobody who can argue with that. But if we take them up there, if they go up there... Now, wait a minute. We'll say we spilled first a long ways upriver, and that's where we lost the green canoe and Lewis was hurt. But we all survived and tried to make it downriver in Lewis's canoe. We were overloaded and taking chances trying to get Lewis out and just couldn't control the canoe when we hit the bad rapids. That last half mile of falls got us, and Drew didn't make it. Now stay with that. Stay with it. If we do, we'll make it home tomorrow night. Maybe even tonight. Suppose they don't believe us. What am I going to say when that little rat-faced bastard faces me up to telling him where I said we lost the canoe? Tell him and anybody else around that he misread you. Was there anybody else listening to you when he was talking to you yesterday? No, I don't believe so. That's good. And I don't think I let it slip to that first trooper. Anyway, it's more likely than not that he won't ask you, but will come around and ask me. When he does, I'll let him have it. I'm ready for him. I'm sure glad you told me about him. I sure am. Is that all we have to change? As far as I can tell, I said. Again, Ed, what if they don't believe us? What if there's just enough doubts that, that they'll go looking farther up? Then, like I said, we may be in some trouble, but I don't think they will. Look, there are an awful lot of falls and rapids we came down day before yesterday. It could have happened anywhere up there. And the place where Drew was killed and the part we sunk that other guy was right where the banks of the gorge are the highest and steepest. The only three ways to get there are upriver, which would make the whole search party have to fight rapids after rapids for hour after hour and probably day after day. Search in the river and the rapids and between them foot by foot, and they're not going to want to take that on just because one local guy disbelieves a survivor's story. An outboard wouldn't stand a chance in that stuff, and anything else would be too heavy for the shallows. The other way is downstream, and if they came that way, they'd have to run the same rapids we did, and you know what they're like. How'd you like to have to do that again? They'd be risking their lives, and it just wouldn't be worth it. Besides, how could they be doing that and searching too? They could search in the calm places, and that's where Drew is. 
Right, in one of them. But which one? All right, he said. I guess all right anyway. The only other way in is to come down the cliff. But they'd have to go down and come up it time after time, and they wouldn't do much of that, I can tell you. They might start out doing it, but they wouldn't keep on. What if they went that far back and found the broken rope? Chances are they wouldn't. The rope broke at the very top, and there's a lot of cliff. Anyway, there's not a damn thing we can do about it. Is that all now? Yes, all but one thing. We didn't see anybody on the river. Not since we left Ori have we seen another human being. And that's awfully important, and we can't vary from it. I'm not going to vary from it. I can clue you. We haven't seen anybody. I wish we hadn't. We didn't. The only other thing is whether somebody was reported missing in that area, and people knew more or less where the person was going. That bothers me a little, but not so much as some of the other problems. Those were awful-looking men. Who'd care where they were? Somebody might. That's right, somebody might. But whether the person would know where they went or the area or direction they went in, we just can't have any idea. That one is that one is beyond us. That's where we've got to ride on luck, and I feel lucky. The odds is good. Bobby laughed, and some of it was really laughter. Do you reckon this room is bugged, or that somebody could be listening? It's not bugged, I said. But that sure is a thoughty notion of yours, cousin. I slid off my tennis shoes and went to the door sock-footed and listened. Keep talking, I whispered back to Bobby. Keep talking and give me time to listen, too. I listened. I listened for the nose whistle of breath, and maybe it was there. But then you can always hear breath anywhere when you want to. I couldn't hear enough, though, for it to really be breath. Or at least I didn't think I could. I took hold of the knob and jerked the door inward. Nothing. Were there any sound going down the stairs? No? I was sure. No. I turned back to Bobby and held up a circle of fingers. I'll be in my room, I said. Go get us those clothes and then we'll hustle our asses over to the hospital. Lewis will still be knocked out, I bet, and I doubt they'll pump him too hard anyway, but we better try to get the change in story across to him or see what he remembers of the first one. I went back to my room, shucked off the nylon, and lay thinking again. I was looking forward to the encounter with the local sheriff, or whatever he was. I was looking forward to his local species of entrapment. The sun came up more and I pushed back the covers and lay in it. I was still tired, but the main tiredness had pulled back from me and the bright light held it off me. It was very good lying there wounded and stronger. Not so badly wounded now. The stitches were pulling me together and a lot stronger now. Yes, indeed. Bobby came back with the clothes, and I pulled on dry blue jeans, a work shirt, white socks, and a pair of clod-hopping brogans that linked me to the earth with every step. But I was not that tired anymore, and I enjoyed lifting them just enough. I watered up the nylon in my hand, and we went downstairs together, both in farm clothes. It was exhilarating now to be so dry. The woman who owned the place was dusting. Would you get rid of these for me? I asked her, holding out the nylon outfit full of my blood. She looked at me. I'd be glad to, she said. I ain't but one thing to do with them. I can't think of anything more to do with them, I said, except to burn them. That's what I mean, she said. Can't use them for rags. She smiled. We smiled. Bobby and I got into Drew's car and drove out to the hospital. There were two highway patrol cars there. 
here we go, I said. Hold on. We went in, and a fellow in white showed us to the ward where Lewis was. There were three highway patrol officers there, talking quietly among themselves with toothpicks in their mouths, and Lewis was lying either asleep or under sedation in a corner of the empty ward with a sheet medically levitated over his legs. The sandy-haired doctor was beside him, inclining his head and writing something again. He turned as he heard my heavy new steps. Hello, killer, he said. How'd you sleep? Good. Better than the riverbank. Stitches holding? You know it. Holding me together, like you said. There ain't nothing getting in or out. Good, he said. In his way of going serious, I liked. Lewis came to us before I had a chance to say anything else. He moved a little up from the waist. He came like a muscular act. The veins of his biceps jumped clear, clear as anatomy, and he opened eyes. I turned to the patrolman. Have you been talking to him? I asked. No, one of them said. We've been waiting for him to come around. He's around, I expect, or he will be soon, I said. Give him a minute. He was looking straight at me. Hello, Tarzan, I said. How's the world of the great white doctor? White, he said. What have they been trying to do to you? You tell me, he said. I've got a heavy leg and there's some pain in there rambling around. But we got clean sheets and there ain't that grating sound when I move. So I guess it's all right. I got in between Lewis and the nearest patrolman. Got in close, almost head to head, and winked. He winked back, though anybody who didn't know it was a wink wouldn't have. Just don't let's get on that last stretch of water again, buddy, he said. Not today, anyway. He had given it to me without knowing it. I took it, hoping that it had been loud enough. Everything went, I said. Drew was killed. You remember me telling you? I think so, he said. I don't remember him in the canoe after that. I don't remember. You remember all that spray? I asked. I remember sort of, he said. Was that where it was? That's where it was for Drew, I said slowly. You and Steinhauser's tub bought it in that first spill upriver. I couldn't see anything, he said. Looking straight up, I couldn't even see the sky. No sky, I said. No sky at all. I rounded my hurt side back to the patrolman. Where do you see it, I said. You'll understand what the man's talking about. Y'all want to wait on down here, ways? One of the patrolmen, a new one, said to us. We pulled back down along the corridor. But Lewis had got the message I was sure he had, and not too soon. Bobby and I walked along in our new clothes. Neither of us had had a chance to shave, and we were pretty grubby but clean. A shave would have made me a completely new person, but I was half new anyway, and half new was very good. It is better to come back easily. After about 15 minutes, the new officer walked ordinarily along to us. Why don't we all go, go back into town, he said. All right, I told him, whatever you say. I got into the front seat of the patrol car with him, and we started back. I didn't say anything, and he didn't either. When we reached town, he went into a cafe and made a couple of calls. <clears throat> it frightened me some to watch him talk through the tripled glass, windshield, plate glass, and phone booth glass, for it made me feel caught in the whole vast, inexorable web of modern communications. I was not sure that this was not the beginning of the enormous, unfathomable apparatus of crime detection from which no one is entirely free. 
I could imagine stupendous filing systems, IBM machines tirelessly sorting punch cards, one thing being checked against another. I was not sure he was not talking to J. Edgar Hoover. Our story could not stand up against that, I was sure. And yet it might even so. The patrolman came back and sat with me with his door open. In a little while, two more patrol cars showed up. A small crowd started to drift together. A head turned toward us and another. Eventually, all heads looked at us at least once, and most of them more than once. I sat still in my clothes of the country. I could prove where I had bought them. My hurt was good in the midst of the general unhurt. One of the police from another car was talking to a local fellow about roads going up the river. A few minutes after this, we all got ready to start out. I looked for Bobby. He was in one of the new highway patrol cars. As we left, another police car, very local-looking, drove up and by, and I saw my man, an old fellow, rusty and quiet. There was going to be a meeting somewhere upriver. My beard tingled at the roots, and I started to calculate yet once again. We turned off the highway and drove down a little road that swung through a farmer's yard and then through his chicken yard. A woman was feeding the chickens, muffled up against the sun as though against cold. We moved on slower and slower. Nothing had happened yet. Nothing had happened to any of us yet. There had been no accusations made, nothing discovered. My lies seemed better, more and more like the truth. The bodies in the woods and in the river did not move. We were the lead car. We took off through some glaring cornfields and then into poor-looking woods, second-growth pines like turpentine trees. I listened for the river but saw it before I heard it. The road got worse and worse the nearer we got. It figured. At the river's edge, we were crawling. It's about where it was? A cop asked me. No, I said, waking from a half-sleep I didn't know I was in. It was further up. We wouldn't have come down here all the way from Ori if we wanted to turn the canoe over in calm water. He looked at me oddly, or I suppose he did, for I was watching straight ahead for the yellow tree, and listening, one more time, for the falls. It seemed curious to be going toward them from this direction. It was an hour of slow going over gullies and washouts with just enough track for regular cars. If it had got any worse, it would have been Jeep or Land Rover country before we saw the tree. I saw the color and then the lightning jag, and my heart jumped like a whole being, inside me and nearly out. The rapids were roaring upstream about a quarter of a mile. I could see some of them now, and they were a lot worse, even, than I remembered. The fall-off was a good six feet, and the only place where a canoe could get through was a funnel of water into which the whole river cramped and shot, blizzarding through the stones and beating and fuming like some enormous force chained to the spot. The policeman pointed. He'd be right in here? I'd say so, I said. He may be downstream farther, though, or he may be caught in the rocks, but we probably ought to start here. We all got out and moved toward each other. I watched Bobby over the hoods and backs of cars. He was not moving among the men. They were wandering rather freely around him, and his stillness in the midst of them suggested that he was not able to move as freely as they or at all. I don't think anyone noticed this but me, or put this interpretation on it, but it made me nervous. He already looked like a prisoner. For an instant, I actually thought he was in leg shackles. I started toward him, but the police from the three cars always came between us, which must have been intentional, though they managed to give the impression it wasn't. Then Bobby moved like everybody else toward the river. Meanwhile, other cars were creeping up to us, and pretty soon they filled up the bank all the way out of sight down river. The men who got out of them were farmers, mostly, and small merchants, or so I supposed. Some of them brought long ropes and hooks, grapples, on them. 
and I understood the full horror of the phrase I was always seeing in the newspapers, especially in the summer, drag the river for the body. Drag was right. This the phone? Excuse me. This the place? The patrolman asked me again. It's the best I can do, I said. As far as I'm concerned, this is it. The men began to deploy with their ropes and hooks. The stream was not deep at this point, about up to their waist or lower chest. The river ran through them easily. I watched the chains and ropes and wire cables come up from the water empty in a certain rhythm. They always seemed to have grasped something when the hooks were underwater and just to have to let it go when they were pulled back up. I sat under a bush with a patrolman who had driven me out, watching each of the men and waiters do what he was doing at the moment, and remembered the ring on Drew's finger and the dead guitar calluses on his hand as he fell from my arms. Someone was coming, casually but deliberately. I turned to say something to the other patrolman so that I would seem unaware of the other person's approach. Sorry, buddy, the new man said. Can I talk to you for a minute? Sure, I said. Sit down. He did. We shook hands. He was an old seam-faced, light-bodied man with hazel eyes. He wore his hat at the prescribed country tilt, which always amused me whenever I saw it. I almost smiled, but instead took a cigarette he offered and lit up. Are you sure this is the place? I repeated, not all that sure, but I can't do any better. He's either in those rocks up there, or here, or downstream. How far downstream, I don't know. You say you're... You say he's coming down this here river in a canoe. Two canoes we started with. How come? How come what? How come you'd be doing this in the first place? Oh, I said hesitating and not really knowing the answer even now. I guess we just wanted to get out a little. Uh, All of us work in the city, it gets pretty tiresome just sitting in an office all the time. The fellow who broke his leg, he's been up here before fishing. He said we ought to see it before they dam the river and make a public park out of it, that's all. No really good reason, I suppose, just boredom. I can understand that, he said after a little while. You didn't know what you was getting into, did you? No, indeed, we didn't, I said. We sure didn't know it would be anything like this. He thought this over. You see these big old wide rocks yonder? How come you didn't try to get out and drag your canoe over them instead of trying to come through that there bad place? How can we try to ride on through? The river's running awful fast up above here. These are just the very last of the rapids. We had too much speed by them, and this part didn't look as bad as it is. We couldn't see the drop-off until we were right on top of it and going too fast to do anything but go over it. And when it fell off, we fell out. Then your buddy couldn't be back up yonder in them other rocks now, could he? No, I said. That's why I suggested that y'all start looking for him right here. He wouldn't be in the upstream rocks, but he could be hung up under a rock someplace under the drop-off. Wouldn't be much left of him, would there? I guess not. You say you started out a day before yesterday? We started out Friday at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. In, In two canoes. Right. And you lost one of them right here. No, a long ways upstream. When we came through here, we were all in one canoe. This was the silence now. It went on for at least a minute. Your buddy says different. I'll be damned if he does. I said, go ask him. I already done asked him. Ask him again, or the one in the hospital. No, no. 
you done had a chance to talk to him. Your hearing must not be any too good. It's good enough. We ain't gonna find nobody right in here. We're gonna find it farther up. What the hell are you driving at? I said. And the indignation was real. He was assaulting my story, which had cost me so much time and energy, and yes, blood. I leaned to the state policeman. Look, do I have to put up with this? I'll be goddamned if I will. I can tell you. Is he authorized to do this? Maybe you better answer a few more questions, then he can handle it however he wants to. We found that other canoe, or half of it, before you say you even got down in this part of the river. So what? I told you we lost the other one farther up, back up in a gorge. If you want to try to go up in there, I can take you and show you where it was. You know we can't get back up in there. That's your problem. What the hell is this about anyway? We've been through a goddamn bad time, and I'm damned if I want to put up with this kind of shit. Listen, are you the sheriff here? Deputy. Is the sheriff around here? He's right over yonder. Well, go get him. I want to talk to him. He got up and went over to a beefy Texasy farmer with a badge, and they came back together. I shook hands with the sheriff, whose name was Bullard. Sheriff, I don't know why this man, I don't know what this man has in mind, because he won't tell me, but from what I can gather, he thinks we threw one of our party in the river or something. Maybe you did, the old man said. For Christ's sake, for what reason? How would I know that? I know you can't get your story straight, and there ain't no good reason for you to be lying. Easy, Mr. Queen, the sheriff said. Then to me, what about this? What do you mean, what about it? Look, if you can find one person, and I mean one, who will back up what he says, I'll be perfectly happy to do anything you want me to do. Go back up in the woods with you, wait up the river, join your crew out there dragging, anything you say. But this man is just confused. He's got some kind of personal stake in this. He doesn't like city people. He's trying to create interest in himself. God knows what. What's the matter, Mr. Queen? People feel like you're not earning your money? I'll tell you what's the matter, you city son of a bitch, Queen said in that country murderous tone that always bled me white. My sister called me yesterday and told me her husband had been out hunting and hadn't come back yet. There ain't nobody up in them woods up yonder. I'll just goddamn well guarantee y'all met up with him somewhere. And I'm on prove it. Fine, prove it. What is wrong with you, Mr. Queen? The sheriff asked. Why jump on these fellas about something in your family, just because they're from the city? Maybe your brother-in-law fell down and got hurt. Nah, he wouldn't have. Why are you so damn sure that anything happened to him? I said. I just got a feeling, Queen said, and I ain't never wrong about that. Well, you're wrong this time, I said. Now stop bothering me. Go and do whatever you've got a mind to do. But get off my back. I've had it with this river, with the woods, with the whole fucking business up here, and most especially with you. Unless you've got something to accuse us of and have got some evidence to support what you're saying, whatever it is, you can goddamn well leave me alone. He backed off, muttering, and I went over to the patrolman I had been sitting beside. Queen didn't have a thing on us, and he wouldn't get anything. I wondered if one of the two men we had killed had really been in his brother-in-law, and I tried to think of a way to find out his name, but decided I had better let it go. There was no real reason I needed to know his name, especially... There was no real reason I needed to know his name, except for my own satisfaction, and I doubted that it would be much satisfaction either way. The men in the river were working downstream, Every now and then, one of the hooks would snag a rock, and everybody would converge on it. 
I could see the light in their eyes change, some dreading, some anticipating, some happy. My blood quickened and my side hurt within its hurt when this happened, but it was always for nothing. All day, almost, the wound leapt and subsided, and in all that time the searchers made only about 200 yards. Sheriff Bullard came over. Looks like that's going to have to wind it up tonight, he said, getting too dark. I nodded and got up. You boys be staying in Aintree this evening? I guess so, I said. We're still pretty tired and beat up, and I want to see how Lewis is doing in the hospital. He had a bad break in his leg. He's bad, the sheriff said. The doctor said he's never seen a worsen. We're at Biddeford's, I said, but you know that. Yep, I know it. We'll be coming back out here tomorrow morning. You can come if you want to, but you don't have to. I don't see any reason for us to come, I said. If the body's not right in here, I don't know where it is. Maybe farther downstream. We're going to try upstream a little. No use, I said, but do whatever you think's right. If you find any bodies up there, though, they won't be Drew's. This is where he went under, and if you find him, it'll be downstream. Maybe we'll split up, and some work up, some work down. Okay. Fine. But this is the place. I'd bet my life on it. I marked it with that big yellow tree, and I kept looking at it all the time we were trying to find him. He's down river. There's not but one way he can go. Right, said the sheriff. Not but one way. We'll let you know if we find him, and I'll come by to see you all sometime tomorrow afternoon. Much obliged to you for your trouble. Bobby and I ate another big dinner and went up to bed. There was no need to talk anymore. All the talking had been done. Now was the time for the finding or the not finding. The next day we went out to see Lewis, who was much better. His leg was raised in pulleys, and he was reading the county paper which had a story about Drew's disappearance and an account of dragging the river for him with a picture in it which I could recognize myself and Deputy Queen. He had his fist up at my face. I knew that the picture had been taken during the last part of the time we had been talking. I looked like I was being tolerant, just barely listening out of courtesy. Everything helped. This too. There were no policemen with Lewis, but he was not alone in the ward anymore, for the night before they had brought in the farmer they had brought in a farmer whose foot had been run over by a tractor. He was at the other end and asleep. I told Lewis what had happened and told him that Bobby would drive his car back down to the city and his wife or somebody could come right after him whenever he was ready to move. That was all right with him. Bobby and I walked over to say goodbye to Lewis. He was eased back in the pillows. I ought to be out of here in a week or two myself, he said. Sure, I said. Lie back and enjoy yourself. This is not such a bad town. Bobby and I drove back to Biddeford's to wait for the sheriff. He came at 5.30 and evil little queen was with him. The sheriff took out a piece of paper. You can use this for a statement, he said. See if it says what you told us. I read it through. It's all right, I said, but I don't know these place names. Is this the right name of the rapids where I said we capsized? Yeah, he said, that's the name. Griffin Shoot. Okay, I said, and signed it. You're sure now, Sheriff Bullard asked. You better believe I'm sure. He ain't sure, Deputy Queen said, a lot louder than any of us. He's lying. He's lying through his teeth. He's done something up yonder. He done killed my brother-in-law. Listen, you little bastard, I said, and my voice was really quivering. Maybe your brother-in-law killed somebody. Why are you bringing all this talk of killing? The river did all the killing we saw. If you don't think it'll kill you, you get your stupid ass on it and see for yourself. Now, Mr. Gentry, the sheriff said, don't talk like that. Ain't no call for it. Well, this'll do till there is, I said. He's lying, sheriff. Don't let him go. Don't let the son of a bitch go. We ain't got nothing to hold him for, Arthur. Sheriff said, nothing. These boys have been through a lot. They want to go back home. 
Don't let him go, I'm telling you. Listen, my sister called up last night, and she was just a-crying. Benson ain't come home yet. She knows he's dead. She just knows it. He ain't never been gone this long before. And these fellers were the only ones up there when he was. Now, you don't know that, Arthur, the sheriff said. What you mean is, they was the only city fellows. I shook my head as though I couldn't believe such stupidity, which was the case. Sure enough. Y'all can go any time you want to, the sheriff said. Just leave me your addresses. I did and said, okay, let us know if you find anything. Don't worry. You'll be the first. I slept again, as in a place beyond all sleep, around on the other side of death, and came back floating, when I thought I heard the ringing of the owl on the other birds, and in Martha's wind toy at home. It was early, and we were free. I dressed and went to Bobby's room and woke him. The woman who owned the place was up, and we paid her with the last of our money and drove to the filling station to get Lewis's car. The sheriff was sitting there talking to the owner. We got out. Morning, he said. Y'all get an early start, huh? Thought we would, I said. What can we do for you? Not a thing, he said. Just wanted to make sure you had your keys and everything you need. We can make it fine, I said. There is one thing, Sheriff, though. We owe some fellows up in Ori for bringing these cars down to us. Would you tell them that we'll send the money just as quick as we get back to the city? They'll believe you before they will us because you live up here. They know who you are. Be glad to, he said. What are their names? Griner. They run a garage up there. I'll get word to them. Don't worry about it. And you say they're the last people you saw before you got down here? The last and the only. There was also another man with them. I don't know who he was. Maybe we ought to know who he was. I might even go up there and talk to all of myself. And you can be sure I'll tell them about the money. Okay. We're going along now. Take it easy going home, he said. And buddy, let me tell you one thing. Don't ever do anything like this again. Don't ever come back here. You don't have to worry about that, I said. I grinned and slowly so did he. Is this your way of telling me to get out of town and not show my face in these here parts again? You might say that, he said. Oh, now, Sheriff, you know we ain't no hired guns, I said, like Texas. We're all bow and arrow, man. You listen to me now, boy. You ought to be in the movie, Sheriff, or go live in Montana. You could probably find worse bad men than me in either one. I might do that, he said. Not too much action here, I can tell you. A few people stealing chickens, a little moon shining. Not much action. Not till we came. Yeah, and we don't want no more of that. Dragging that river's tough. Neither do we. You won't see us again. Okay, so long. Have a good trip. So long, and I hope Deputy Queen finds his brother-in-law. Oh, he'll come in drunk. He's a mean bastard anyway. Old Queen's sister would be better off without him. So would everybody else. I started to get in Drew's car. Before you go, buddy, let me ask you something. Tell you something. Ask me. How come you all ended up with four life jackets? Well, you had an extra one. In fact, we had two. You're liable to find another one, find another one down river. They float, you know. Now, what was it you wanted to tell me? You done good. Somebody had to do something, I said. I didn't want to die either. You's hurt bad, but if it wasn't for you, you'd all be in the river with your other man. Thanks, Sheriff. I'll take that with me. You damn fucking ape, he said. Who on earth's your father, boy? Tarzan, I said. Bobby settled into Lewis's wagon, and I got a map from the rack at the station and buckled down in the other car. Let's go get the canoe, I hollered over. Jesus, no, 
Leave it. I never want to see it or touch it or smell it again. Leave the goddamn thing. No, I said, we're going to get it. Follow me. It'll just take a minute. Some kids were playing in the canoe, and I thought this was a good sign, indicating that Deputy Queen wasn't around. Also, they might have washed out Lewis's vomit, or some of it anyway. I got the kids out and took a long look at the hole. It was really battered and beat up, not only along the bottom but on the sides, clear up to the gunwales in some places. I felt the rock shocks all over again just looking at them. There were a couple of holes, small holes, close together in the middle, but it could have stood some more, though maybe not a whole lot. Before we began to struggle with the boat, I chanced to look up at the river, and there were some men moving among the trees. There was a little cemetery there, so well hidden among the trees and bushes that I would not have seen it at all, except for the human forms moving there. I asked one of the children what was happening. Is it a funeral? No, one muddy little girl said. They're going to move them people before they finish the dam. They're digging them up. I had known that it was no funeral. There was too much movement, but I wasn't quite prepared for this. I looked closer, and there were some green coffins stacked together, and a couple of the men were disappearing below the ground and coming back up together, heaving at something. Like TVA, I guess, I said to Bobby. I guess, he said. Come on, for God's sake, let's leave this place. We wrestled the canoe through the kudzu and strapped it to the roof of the wagon. Go ahead, Bobby, I said. You know where Lewis lives. Tell Miss Medlock what happened. And remember to tell it like it was. She'll take care of you. Then call Martha when you get in and tell her I'll be right along. I'll remember what to say, he said. How could I forget? I went back down to the spillway and stood next to the water for the last time. I stooped and drank from the river. Going back was easy and pleasant, though. I was driving a dead man's car, and everything in it reminded me of him. The good shape the engine was in, the neatness of it, the little decal of the company he worked for on the windshield. The only thing to do was to get outside the car into the landscape and to watch my own world develop from it as I went toward the city. After four hours, I passed slowly from the country of nine-fingered people and prepared to meet thy God into the drive-ins and motels and homes of the Whopper, but all I could see was the river. It came at me between rocks, and here the car would involuntarily speed up. It came at me in slow loops and green stillnesses with trees and cliffs and life-saving bridges. And I could not leave off worrying about the details of the story we had told or what the ramifications of any one of them might be. I was sure about Lewis, as sure of him as I was of myself, but who could be that sure of either of any man? But I was not sure of Bobby. He drank an awful lot, and a person will say, a lot of times, exactly the most perverse and self-incriminating thing he can think of when he is drunk enough, and when he is like Bobby. But what would keep his mouth shut about the truth was himself kneeling over the log with a shotgun at his head, howling and bawling and kicking his feet like a little boy. He wouldn't want anybody to know that, no matter what, no matter how drunk he was. No, he would stay with my version of things. The version was strong. I had made it and tried it out against the world, and it had held. It had become so strong in my mind that I had trouble getting back through it to the truth. But when I did, the truth was there. The moon shone and pressed down the wild river. The cliff was against my heart, beating back at it with the pulse of stone, and a pine needle went subtly into my ear as I waited in a tree for the light to come. I was on the final four lane now. I had eaten in almost every drive-in along here. I had shopped in about half the stores in the shopping center where I was now turning off, and Martha had shopped in them all. 
I went up the long residential hill away from the moan of the great trucks and Amoco rigs. I turned off again and went curving easily home. It was about two o'clock. I drove into the yard and knocked on the back door. They were going to save me here. Martha opened the door. We stood for a while, feeling each other closely, and then went in. I took off my brogans and stood in the corner, and stood them in the corner, and walked around on the wall-to-wall carpeting. I went out to the car and took the knife and belt and slung them off deep into the suburban woods. I could use a drink, sugar, I said. Tell me, she said, looking at my side. Tell me, what happened to you? I knew something like this would happen. No, you didn't, I said. Not anything like this. Come lie down, baby, she said. Let's, let me have a look. I went with her to the bedroom where she put an old rag sheet on the bed and I lay down on it. She pulled off my shirt and looked with pure practical love and then she stepped to the bathroom for three or four bottles. The whole medicine cabinet looked like a small hospital itself packed into the wall. She came back shaking bottles. Give me that drink, love, I said. Then we can get into all this playing doctor. All doctors play doctor, she said, and all nurses play nurse, and all ex-nurses play nurse, especially when they love somebody. She brought me the bottle of wild turkey, and I turned it up and drank. Then she started soaking through the bandage with some household mystery from the bathroom. It came off me shred by shred, and the inside was bloody indeed. The stitches were slimy. (laughs) The stitches were slimy with blood and some other bodily matter, whatever I had at that place. You're all right, she said. It's a good job. The edges are pulling together. Good news, I said. Can you fix it up again? I can fix it, she said. But what happened to you? There are cut wounds, clean edges, most of them. Did somebody get you with a knife? An awful sharp one? I did. I said it was me. What kind of accident? No accident, I said. Look, let me go see Drew's wife. Then I'm coming back and sleep for a week. Right with you. Right with you. She was professional and tender and tough, what I would would have hoped for. What I knew I could have expected, what I had undervalued. She put antibiotic salve all over the place and then several layers of gauze and then tape expertly, letting the air come through. When I got up, the wound was not so stiff and my side had begun to be a part of me again, though it was still hurt and hurt badly. It was not pulling against me at every move. Will you follow me over and drive me back? She nodded. At Drew's house, his horned little boy in a Cub Scout uniform opened the door. I went in with the car keys in my hand while Pope went to get Mrs. Ballinger. I stood there, surrounded by Drew's things, the walls full of tape recorders and record cabinets, the sales awards, and company citations. The keys in my hand were jangling. Mrs. Ballinger, I said as she came at me, Drew has been killed. It was as though I had said it to stop her, to keep her from getting at me. It stopped her. One hand came up slowly, almost dreamingly, from her side and went to her mouth, and the other came over it to hold it down. Behind her fingers, her head shook in a small, intense moment of disbelief. He was drowned, I said. Lewis broke his leg. Bobby and I were just lucky. We could have all been killed. She held her mouth. The keys jangled and rang. I brought the car back. So useless, she said, her voice filled with fingers. So useless. Yes, it was useless, I said. We shouldn't have gone, but we did. We did. Such a goddamn useless way to die. I guess every way is useless, I said. Not this useless. 
We stayed as long as they needed us up there looking for the body. They're still looking. I don't think they'll find it, but they're looking. Useless. Drew was the best man we had, I said. I'm I'm so sorry. I'm so goddamn sorry. Is there anything I can do? I mean, can I... You can get out of here, Mr. Gentry. You can get out of here and go find that insane friend of yours, Lewis Medlock, and you can shoot him. That's what you can do. He's pretty badly hurt himself, and just as sorry as I am. Please understand that. It's not his fault. It's the river's fault. It's our fault for going with him. All right, she said from far off, from the future, from all the years coming up, and from the first night alone in bed. All right, Dad. Nobody can do anything. Nobody can ever do anything. It's all so useless. Everything is useless. It always has been. I saw she was becoming speechless, but I tried one more thing. Can I have Martha come over and stay with you for a couple days? I don't want Martha. I want Drew. She broke, and I started toward her, but she shook her head violently, and I backed off, turned, put the keys on the coffee table beside the company history, and went out. As we drove home, I wondered if it would have been any better if I'd been able to tell the truth. Would it be easier for her if I could tell her that Drew was lying in a wild stretch of the Kulawasi with part of his head bashed in by either a bullet or a rock, sunk down with a stone and a bowstring eddying a little back and forth side to side with the motion of the water? I did not see how knowing that would help. The only possibility was that it might spark in her the animal mania for revenge if he truly had been shot, and nothing more could be done about that than had already been done. No electric chair, no rope or gas chamber could avenge him better or as well. Back at home, I put an easy chair in front of the picture window and got a blanket and a pillow and sat looking out onto the street with the phone beside me all afternoon. I was shaking. Martha sat on the floor and put her hel- and put her head in my lap and held my hand, and then went and got a bottle of whiskey and a couple glasses. Baby, she said, tell me what it is. Is somebody after you? I don't know. I said, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Somebody may be after me. Also, the law may be after me. I've just got to tough it out. If nothing happens for a couple weeks, I think we'll be all right. Can't you tell me? No, I can't tell you now. Maybe I can't ever tell you. Who cut you, Ed? Who cut my good man? I did it, I said. I fell on one of my arrows and I had to cut it out with a knife. There was not any other way. I couldn't get us down river with an arrow sticking through me, so I cut. I'm glad the knife was sharp or I'd probably still be hacking. Go to sleep, honey. I'll let you know if anything happens. I'm right here with you. There's no more woods. No more river. Just go to sleep. But I couldn't. We live on a dead-end street so that any car that comes down it either belongs to the people who live on the street or has some business with them. I watch the few cars I recognize come in and turn into the various driveways. About ten o'clock, one stopped in front of our house. The lights swung slowly around and enveloped us and Martha closed my mouth with a warm hand as I sat there blinded. Ours was the last driveway, and the driver was just using it to turn around in. He went away, and finally so did I. I woke up, and Martha was still with me. It was light. The crooked part in her hair was very precious. She was asleep, and gently as I could, I got up from under her, put her head in the chair, picked up a glass and the whiskey, and went into the bathroom. I turned around, and Martha was standing there, too. She kissed me, and then sat on the toilet seat and pulled the bandage tape off my side with quick, surgical rips. Better, she said. It's going to be fine. Jesus, you're healthy. I don't feel so healthy, I can tell you. I'm still tired. Well, you rest up. No, I'm going to the office. No, you're not. That's the silliest damned idea I've ever heard of. You're going to bed. 
really, I want to go down there. I want to and I need to for lots of reasons. All right, dum-dum, go ahead and kill yourself. Not a chance, I said. But if I don't keep busy, I'll fall apart. I can't stand any more of this car watching. She redressed my side, and I went downtown. The main thing was to get back into my life as quickly and as deeply as I could, as if I had never left it. I walked into my office and opened the door wide so that anybody who wanted to... (laughs) so that anybody who wanted to look could see me there, shuffling papers and layouts. At lunch, I went out and bought a paper. There was a notice of Drew's death and an old picture of him from his college annual. That was all. I worked hard the rest of the day, and when I drove the freeway home, it was like a miracle of movement and of freedom. And so it ended, except in my mind, which changed the events more deeply into what they were, into what they meant to me alone. There is still a special small fear in any strange automobile headlights near the house or any phone call with an unfamiliar voice in it, either at the office or at home or when Martha calls me at the office. For a long time, I went through both daily papers from column to column every day, but only once did the word Kalawasi come off the page at me, and that was when the dam at Aintree was completed. The governor dedicated it, there was a ceremony with college and high school bands, and the governor was said to have made a very good speech about the benefits, mainly electrical and industrial, that the dam would bring to the area, and touching on the recreational facilities that would be available when the lake filled in. Every night as the water rose higher, I slept better, feeling the green, darkening color crawl up the cliff, up the sides of the rock feeling for the handholds I had had, dragging itself up until finally I slept as deeply as Drew was sleeping. Only a few days after I saw the story in the paper, I knew that the grave of the man we had buried in the woods was underwater, and from the beginning of the inundation, Drew and the other man were going deeper and deeper, piling fathoms and hundreds of tons of pressure and darkness on themselves falling farther and farther out of sight, farther and farther from any influence on the living. Another odd thing happened. The river and everything I remembered about it became a possession to me, a personal, private possession, as nothing else in my life ever had. Now it ran nowhere, but in my head, but there it ran as though immortally. I could feel it. I can feel it. On different places on my body. It pleases me. It pleases me in some curious way that the river does not exist and that I have it. In me it still is and will be until I die, green, rocky, deep, fast, slow, and beautiful beyond reality. I had a friend there, who in a way had died for me, and my enemy was there. The river underlies, in one way or another, everything I do. It is always finding a way to serve me, from my archery to some of my recent ads and to the new colleagues I have been attempting for my friends. George Hawley, my old Brack enthusiast, bought one from me when I hired him back and it hangs in his cubicle, full of sinuous forms threading among the headlines of war and student strikes. George has become my best friend next to Lewis and we do a lot of serious talking about art, more than we should with the workload the studio has been accumulating. I saw Bobby only once or twice in the city, just nodding to each other in public places. I couldn't tell from looking at him how he was, but he had returned to the affable, faintly nasty manner he had always had, and I was as glad as not to leave him alone. He would always look like dead weight and like screaming, and that was no good to me. 
I later learned that he had quit the company he was working for and tried to go into business with a partner running a chicken in a basket drive-in and carry-out near a local engineering college, but it failed after a year and he moved to another city, and then I heard to Hawaii. Thad and I are getting along much better than before. The studio is still boring, but not as boring as it was. Dean is growing up well, though he is a strangely silent boy. He looks at me sometimes from the sides of his eyes and seems about to speak in a way he has not spoken before. But that is probably only my imagination. He has never said anything except the things any boy would say to his father. Otherwise, he is sturdy and uncomplicated and beginning to be handsome. Lewis is something of an idol to him. He is lifting weights already. Because of the association she had for me, I looked up the girl in the kitten britches ad and took her out to dinner a couple times. I still loved the way she looked, but her golden half eye had lost its fascination. Its place was in the night river, in the land of impossibility. That's where it was magic for me. I left it there, though I would have liked to see her hold her breast once more in a small space full of men. I see her every now and then, and the studio uses her. She is a pleasant part of the world, but minor. She is imaginary. Martha is not. In summer, we sit by a lake where we have an A-frame cottage, it is not Lake Kahula. It is over on the other side of the state, but it is also a damned lake. And look out over the water, maybe drinking a beer in the evening. There is a marina on the other side. We sit and watch the boats go out, and the water skiers leap from the earth side to their long, endless, feathery step on the green topsoil of water. Lewis limps over from his cabin now and then, and we look at each other with intelligence, feeling the true weight and purpose of all water. He is changed too, but not in obvious ways. He can die now. He knows that dying is better than immortality. He is a human being, and a good one. Sometimes he refers to me as you see, which means to him and me unorganized crime, and this has become a kind of minor conversation piece at parties and at lunch in the city with strangers. Sometimes, too, we shoot, we shoot archery at the lake where Lewis has put a bale and a field target in a beautiful downhill shot about 55 yards between trees. We shoot dozens of aluminum arrows, but I have never put another broadhead in the bow. My side wouldn't allow it. I can feel it cry at the idea. Besides, there is no need to. The bow I use now is too light for hunting. Lewis is still a good shot, and it is still a pleasure to watch him. I think my release is passing over into Zen, he said once. Those gooks are right. You shouldn't fight it. Better to cooperate with it. Then it'll take you there. Take the arrow there. Though Lake Kahula hasn't built up like the one we're on, there are indications that people are getting interested in it, as they always do any time a new, nice place opens up in what the real estate people call an unspoiled location. I expect there are still a few deer around Lake Kahula, deer that used to spend most of their time on the high ground at the top of the gorge, but in a few years they will be gone, and perhaps only the unkillable tribe of rabbits will be left. One big marina is already built on the south end of the lake, and my wife's younger brother says that the arena is beginning to catch on, especially with the new generation, the one just getting out of high school. This has been Deliverance by James Dickey. Red. By yours truly, Media Gita. I want to thank you for listening. I have just completed my second audiobook, um, this one without commentary. So, this would be my first audiobook um, without commentary. So, thank you very much for listening. This has been Media Gita saying, Have a nice day. <laughs>